Hello and welcome to the world today. We are going to return to the subject of Libya. Mainstream television has this odd habit of prioritizing countries that have been invaded and occupied prior to the invasion, occupation and bombing raids and then forgetting about them. But Libya is still in a mess, even though the coverage has been very muted in most of the world's press. There is talk and action being uh, mooted by the Western regimes led by the United States to try and sort Libya out. That is to try and find a regime in Libya which at least has the trappings of a proper government rather than uh, unruly militias wandering around the country. To aid this PR offensive, businessmen are found, or to be frank, jokers disguised as businessmen, are often found put in charge of huge funds, then removed. Several months ago, Arabian Business, a leading magazine of the Gulf, which specializes in uh, covering business deals, had a cover portrait of a new savior for Libya. Meet Hassan Buhadi, they said, the man tasked with straightening out Libya's $67 billion sovereign wealth fund and changing the fortunes of a stricken nation. Changing the fortunes of a stricken nation. Its fortunes remain the same. It would be interesting to have a look at the bank accounts of uh, Mr. Bohadi and uh, where the, some of the money is. We won't find out at the moment. There's a court case going on in London in which Bohadi is contesting his removal as the chairman of this huge investment fund with someone who was appointed to replace him. So Libya exists on three different levels. There's the reality of what is actually going on in the country. There is rubbish like this, which is uh, promoted in the business press, usually written by English journalists, I have to say. And then there are the plans of the West for Libya. With me is Professor Mabruk Derbesh, I described him the last time he came and spoke with us as a professor in exile. He used to teach at the University of Tripoli, um, and he remains in exile, uh, a close follower of the events that go on in his native country. Mabruk, welcome. Thank you. Tell us now, since we last spoke, you paint, and you painted at that time an incredibly gloomy, depressing picture of what was going on in Libya. Libya was a country completely divided by rival groups of militia, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, native versions of one or the other, combined versions of the both, and they controlled the three key cities in the country. Where are we now? In reality, as you mentioned, Libya lives in different dimensions. Nothing much has changed. There have been change of actors here and there, but the situation has actually gotten worse since, um, since our last interview. Um, <clears throat> Libyan people now strive to get bread so they can eat. Um, banks have no liquidity at all. Um, banks, are, banks are being bankrupt. Uh, by policy and by neglect, both. And Libyans are not able even to go to the bank and get their own money out of it. So how do people live? Most people know this. Libyan society is a very, um, um, a community society where families are aligning each other a lot. So one has money, gives the other one. And the, they live in a family environment. Like there is no single people live in their own. Everybody lives with it his or her family. So that's how people really survive. But a lot of people are barely surviving. Uh, a lot of people have uh, gone the sheet and said, we're hungry. You know, I mean, this is something really unique for Libyan 
individual to go in the street and say, I'm hungry, I can't feed my children, and bring their children in the street and say, you know what, um, you guys do something to them. <laughs> so the situation is very, um, now is very, very dangerous. And, um, and it's, um, I mean, this is not just my opinion. The UN has, a couple of months ago, uh, stated that Libya is going through one of the most uh, or the most dangerous uh, human crisis in the region today. So this is an oil-rich country, and uh, a lot of UN agencies now, they're um, bringing some medicine to Libya worth $1 million. Libya used to give this in, in its day to African countries. And it, uh, this is what Libya used to give in one day. Not, so this is the, the one thing the UN has accomplished, is bringing some medicine for cough or something for cold. Um, so yeah. Um, and to sum it up, really, the situation hasn't really got any much better. And politically speaking, Mabrouk, the same groups control the same territories? Yeah, there's something important about the actors in Libya today, the ones who run, run the country, basically based on militias. Uh, the rule of Libya is the gun today. If you want to become um, a head of a bank, you have to bring your militias, they can put you there. You want to be the head of a university, you bring your militia and they will put you the head of the university. This is how bad it is. Well, Libya used to have one government in Tripoli and another government in the east, in Tobruk. And between those two governments, um, there is another government in, in outside of Libya has been inserted or instituted by the UN. And it seems to be um, better than the two of them. Where is it based? What is it based? Well, it used to be based in Tunisia, and now they just um, try to come to Libya, but they were not allowed to come through the airports because the airports are controlled by the militia. The militia is run by Al Qaeda, the one in Tripoli, which is uh, the head of it. It's Mr. Belhaj, who used to be a Guantanamo Bay. He's a Guantanamo Bay graduate. So they were smuggled in in Tripoli. And they're protected. Some say they're protected by uh, by French troops, or some say um, other troops, British. Or, uh, there's not much news about this, like in details. But now they're trying to get things together in Tripoli and trying to take the, some of the some of the the governing authorities from the other factions in Tripoli. The Tripoli faction. The is. Tripoli faction, and. Uh, but they're doing it the wrong way. The official parliament in Tripoli has not really proved this government. So this government is actually appointed by UN, passing uh, by passing the the parliament and all that. I mean, this is what the democracy they're trying to insert in Libya. This is what they're telling the people: you can have a government that is not approved by the parliament. So it's really an ironic situation in Libya that that's almost laughable. And Belhaj, he is the Libyan who was handed over by British intelligence right. to the Gaddafi regime and was tortured by that regime. And he was even at one point threatening to sue the British government for having handed him over. And he now appears dressed in a Armani or some other posh suit on CNN and is uh, interviewed by their uh, top announcers and interviewers and what are they trying to do with him? Is he the choice now of the United States as the most likely candidate uh, to become president and try and unite the different factions behind him? Well, they kind of moved away from that a little. But I mean, I think he's the backup plan. He's a man who was not tortured in Libya, by the way. It's um, many accounts. I have talked to many people about it and asked, and I, everybody have stated that he was not tortured. He was part of the rendition program. And with the rendition program is, ironically, Gaddafi requested Guantanamo Bay, the Libyans in Guantanamo Bay. He hated the Americans so much, he didn't want them to be in, in an American in prison. But this is when you know Gaddafi's mentality and you study him, you know that this is really part of his psyche. He was put in a villa with his wife and everything. He wasn't even like in a, I mean, his wife was. He was in prison, but he was living comfortably. And the videos now show that he was living comfortably. I mean, he is a, a billionaire now. He owns an airline, and he's Qatar's man in Libya. He controls the main airport in Libya, and he is basically the godfather of most of the most of the Islamic uh, Islamist uh, movement, uh, uh, terrorist groups in Libya. Uh, there are so many of them.
you know, there's ISIS and its cousins, and the cousins are worse. The cousins are locals. The cousins of ISIS. <laughs> I mean, Al-Qaeda, Nusra, all these ones. Mm. When you control the airport, you control who can come in to Libya. And there's so many foreign fighters in Libya now, mostly from Tunisia. I mean, they come from poor family in Tunisia, and they've been giving money to their families in Tunisia. And they Who is hired. He is, Belhaj. Belhaj and, and Qatar. They're recruiting Tunisians. Yeah, they're recruiting poor Tunisians to come to Libya, and, and poor Somalis, and poor Eritreans, and poor um, Sudanese, and Egyptians to come to Libya because, I mean, these are committing suicide bombs. So they, Libyans, they're not really the typical suicide bomber. You never hear about a Libyan suicide bomber, very rarely. But you hear a lot of Tunisians who really, you know, um, do these things. So it's a um, different mentality, a different way of thinking. But Mabrouk, tell me, the three big militias that control Libya today are under whose leadership and under whose command? Well, that's another that's a very good question, because, and it's very important now, today, because just uh, when bringing this government, the new government appointed by the UN, it's with its prime minister, named Siraj, he's the weakest link in the, the old the old parliament, so they brought him in because nobody really disagreed with him. I, 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 we will see if it's a good decision or a bad decision. They created something called the Presidential Council. The Presidential Council now, it's going to be led by somebody's name, uh, Abdurrahman Swahli. He is from the city of Musrata, one of the heavy, um, uh, uh, the heavy, uh, a heavily weaponed uh, militia and one of the strongest militias in Libya. So he's now the head of the presidential council and also he, he oversees those militias. And, and he oversees another militia in Tripoli which is the, the, the most powerful militia in Tripoli. So this is how you see how things are like. A little bit more complicated for maybe the, the average listener but it shows the, the, the moral bankruptcy of the world community when it comes to Libya. Uh, it shows how little they think of the Libyan people, how really the, I mean, the article, uh, the decree 1973 and 70, these were all um, 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 just to show, uh, to just destroy the, yeah. the, the I state. mean, it's not the world community, it's the United States the charades, and the European yeah. Union countries, right. Right. France and Britain in particular, which have gone in, so we shouldn't uh, call them a community. They represent basically their own and American interests <coughs> in right. the region. Um, but they hijacked the world community by... Yeah, you know, when, sarcastically, when yeah. yeah. <laughs> but tell me something. Have you any idea how many foreign troops there are in the in Libya today? Well, uh, it's no, a secret. It's a secret, but they say this government is being brought in just to allow for more foreign troops to come into Libya, and the number has been circulated amongst journalists around the world today who pay attention to the Libyan, and there are very few, by the way. Uh, mm. The Libyan situation is completely put on the backstage. I mean, you hardly get any interviews with Libyans who have different points of view about Libya at all today. Uh, you, you didn't even get calls. Before 19, uh, 2011, you, my phone never really stopped ringing. Today, I don't get any calls. Um, so so uh, they mentioned that amongst those, um, you know, we can call them like, you know, experts. Uh, they say it's, there's a number about seven, six, uh, 6 thousand troops are now prepared to really come to Libya. But now these are British and French, or British and French and Americans. And Americans. But I, a lot of people think that the British are them taking the lead on this situation, and the Italians, sorry, and the Italians as, as, as well. And there's actually a. So they'll be between. under NATO command, obviously. Yeah, um, the umbrella will be NATO. Um, of course, everything happens in this part of the world. The umbrella is NATO, but I mean, they just, uh, they're using NATO. I mean, the, these, these troops are gonna, their commands are gonna be uh, to allegiance to their own countries. So, I mean, the British troops will be, will be controlled by, by Britain. Yeah. And this is one of the problems is like, all the French and the, the Britain, uh, the British and the Americans are not really on the same page when it comes to Libya. So Explain have, that 
Uh, sorry? Explain that. This is started from the beginning. I mean, mm. even in the White House, Clinton is the one who led the war to Libya. Uh, Clinton was in every war, actually, uh, the recent war, starting from the Iraq war to Syria to Libya. Um, she's a warmonger. So from the beginning, there was uh, a fight over soft power uh, as supposed to being, being having a, uh, boots on the trip. Because uh, Obama has said that he was pressured by the French and the British o Obama? into going into Libya, which yeah. is true. Yes. But his own Secretary of State right. and the State Department right. was That's what solidly he, involved. Uh, absolutely. He missed this out. He didn't he wanted to mention because he wanted to blame the British. And he actually called um, uh, Cameron to call them unfavorably. He thought of him as sleeping on the switch and you know he wasn't paying attention this is actually the quote he used he said Cameron was not paying attention I mean how can you not pay attention you, when uh, if you look at Libya today is being completely destroyed I mean how would Libyans feel when they hear Obama saying the head of the of the British government is actually was not paying attention to what's going on in Libya how can you not send how can you send bombs to a country you're not paying attention to what's going on as the case uh, as for the case where uh, with um, um, France, I mean, Sarkozy had a personal issue with Gaddafi. Everybody knows this. I mean, <coughs> we know this, but this, this government is carrying on in the same old way. This government is actually, it's almost flimsy in the way they're doing things. It's just, uh, they're supporting the militias in Musrata to tackle the ISIS in Sirt. The ISIS in Sirt are not really the ISIS you think of as in Iraq. Yeah. The ISIS in Sirt are the people who are um, who got their houses stolen and they've been humiliated in front of their wives and families and mothers and brothers and they were looking for something because they had no weapons to defend themselves against the militia from Musrata when the militia of Musrata invaded Sirat. So they looked for something, they found ISIS, so they just joined ISIS so they can have weapons so they can get even with, with the militias. And now they're called ISIS. And the British, without studying this situation and see how complicated it is and trying to figure out something, because they're not really actual ISIS. They're just basically the term closest to them, that they're freedom fighters. Yeah. You know? But supporting the militias that uh, today, it's another mistake. It's one of the compounding mistakes you keep adding on and adding on. And uh, Well, they've created the militias in the first them. place. Exactly. And now and they're, they're supporting them. They're supporting and, them. And different countries are getting attached to different militias. Exactly. So Qatar is supporting the Tripolis militia. The French are behind the, the militias in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the south of Libya and in uh, eastern of Libya. Um, actually, the French pulled back a little bit. They're not really been proactive since Sarkozy left the government, and the new government doesn't really care much about Libya. Um, so really, it's between the British and British and, uh, and, uh, and the Americans. So the, the, the problem today is actually between the, uh, the Americans are leading uh, their, their way of dealing with Libya is through their puppets uh, in the Gulf area, which is the Qataris and the, and the Emirates. So everybody is subsidizing different, uh, different clown in Libya. Uh, that's the only term I can use. I know. Yeah. I know. They're not really meeting to discuss um, how to deal with the political situation. There is a news came yesterday that the, uh, the, the British ambassador is calling for a meeting, economic meeting of the Friends of Libya in Tunisia in the next couple of days. And this is again, uh, it's almost, you know, uh, they're making mockery of every, every decision, they, everything about Libya. And they're making mockery, mockery of the way they, uh, mm -hmm. they're trying to, uh, school Libya about democracy and all that. This meeting is, is really to what can we gain out of Libya with a semi-stable government. A, a government that can, it's gonna be in a green zone in Tripoli, the militias around it, so they cannot really even move mm. in, in their own city. So, and they're gonna make business with this government. Basically, they just need signatures so they can go into oil fields and yeah. do things. And, you know. I mean, basically, it's a really weird situation because what we are witnessing is a recolonization of Libya by the Western powers, but in a situation where they do not actually control the territory directly and have to deal with the militias. And the deals then, the only 
way to conduct these deals is with money and big money at that. Yeah, well, it's a fantastic chaos. It's the chaos that does not really impact you directly uh, as a European, although it's really like when it comes to migration and everything, Europe really lost so much with, uh, with the fall of Libya yeah. because most of the migrants are now using the long Libyan beach to really come in and the smuggling of humans, uh, humans from Africa, from Syria, from Tunisia, from Morocco, and throw out through Libya to Europe. So, I mean, if you consider this is a bigger problem to Europe, Europe really lost a lot, but um, there's not much invested interest in the way, in the, way in, in the political situation of Libya and fixing it. Um, they're, they're using puppets uh, that they know they're not able to make strategic decisions. Um, they, um, of, of course, in, in 2011, they destroyed the Libyan army completely. So when you destroy an army, you know that you can really move around with your militias. So there's nothing to protect the state. And they, um, they bombed all the infrastructures. When they destroyed the army, and it's, this is another point, uh, one day, I, I don't know, somebody has to go to jail for it, and the, the, the no-fly zone was not really to bomb the Libyan army who were there, who were in their, they were in their bases, basically. They were yes. not really moving. Uh, they, so they hunt them by helicopters. Uh, it was like a mass murder of about 30,000 troops. Uh, How many? 30,000. 30,000 30, troops. 30,000 troops were murdered and they were not fighting back because they didn't have any anti-aircraft and they were sleeping. And some of them were resting, some of them in the, in the barricades, some of them in their uh, uh, bases, some of them were on posts and they were murdered by NATO and uh, been, under the pretext that they're gonna protect Benghazi from, you know, I remember. Uh, that, was the, that was the initial, that was the initial line. And now because of the emails that came out, it shows that even Clinton herself and her People knew that Gaddafi was not really going to do anything in Benghazi, and just um, they just used it as a pretext. As a pretext, yeah. And Clinton herself, her infamous words after Gaddafi was publicly lynched uh, by by some of the so-called militias, uh, she said, "We, we came, came, we saw, so. he died." Yeah. And this is the woman who could be president of the United States. Yeah, she is the most dangerous person today in the political arena, in my view. Not dangerous for Libyans or anybody else, but mostly dangerous for Americans because Americans' lives are go have been lost in Iraq, in Syria, in Libya. Uh, she's going to have another war. Uh, this is what Clinton is. Let's not jump the gun, Mabruk. Maybe she won't win, Let's but you know so, yeah. it's 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 yeah. looking likely. But uh, tell me something. In this entire mess, are there any uh, forces in Libya uh, which are regrouping and trying to create something halfway decent in that country? Um. And this is what's keep us actually optimistic a little, because there are a lot of movements uh, outside of Libya mostly, but a little inside Libya, because if you speak in Libya, you get shot. If you're a journalist and you even complained a little bit about something, even journalists part of the new regime, you know, anti-Gaddafi regime, or anti, the, whatever happens before during Gaddafi, whatever you want to call it, um, if you say something, you get murdered. It's the number, the last number I counted was 72 journalists were killed in the last four years, 72. And just because some of them just said something, you know, that we disagree with something. So it's really the movement inside Libya is, a, is very limited. But outside of Libya, there is a rise in, in, in awareness of what the West is doing in Libya. And you mean mistrust. amongst Libyan exiles? Most Libyan, yeah. And they, uh, they've been organizing themselves in different political groups, very promising political groups. They're making connections. They're talking to the West as well. But now with the mistrust, a complete, complete distrust of everything that's happening. And not many people talking to the British, of course. They consider the British to be British government. 
to be a, a two-sided face, basically. They're Perfidious. saying something. Yeah, Perfidious they're, Albion. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, they're saying something to them, and they're saying something to them, somebody else. else. And this is where uh, they walked away from talking to the British, even though I know some British officials who really mean well, but they've been over, uh, taken over by the overall either not care or um, have... Um, um, uh, a mean opinion. I, I, I don't know how to describe it really. It just their best interest in, is, lies with the destruction of Libya or keeping Libya as it is. The status quo is good because it's uh, we're not getting. We don't want to establish. We don't want Libya to be a powerful nation in this region. No, they, obviously, they don't want Libya to be an independent or even sovereign stable. state. They don't want it. No. They don't want it. On the other hand purely out of economic needs and what their purpose in Libya is, which is the huge reserves of oil. Even though the price of oil is down, it's still needed. Uh, they do want that, and for that they need a stable government, surely. Well, that's what they need. This is the key thing. They need a stable government, and that's it. Yeah. But the stable government does Could not be, be effective. A stable government can be in a green zone, and this is what they're trying to do now. But, uh, so they can pretend there's a government. Exactly. Place. So they can, this, uh, this is small, well-protected government can ask for troops, and that will be legitimate. You know, you, you're not invading the country, basically. You're being invited in. Yeah, yes. So, um, and uh, this um, puppet government, whether they know it or not, the government, uh, going to be able to sign uh, uh, agreements, economic agreements. Uh, you can start building uh, economic societies. Uh, the British government already started one. Um, instead of political, instead of having political officials, they build. The first thing they did is they build economic uh, uh, institution now between Libya and uh, and, uh, and and England. So yeah, this is. Uh, so Mabrouk, where are the bulk of Libyan exiles based? In Tunisia? Tunisia and Egypt, basically. And Egypt. Egypt. Yeah, Egypt, Egypt has the most uh, because they have, I mean, considering the situation in Egypt, they have, they have um, a, they've been given a layway to move and, you know, I mean, they're not allowed to, to have a, a official uh, organization or to, no, there's no are, right to assembly. Informal. Yeah, yeah, but informally they've been allowed to move around mm. and you know and uh, and gather and have uh, uh, the the ones in Europe are few individuals uh, who move around and uh, talk to talk to all the, those countries that they feel that uh, they may have a say um, or they may so help. Mabruk, do you see any hope at all? Yeah, but it's. Uh, it looks longer. It, um, it, it's going to take a long time. Uh, as long as these actors, the Americans, and I mean, as long as the so-called Clintons in the, of the world, who really do not have the best interests of the American people, but have the best interests of other nations, maybe, and I don't want to name them, who do not want to have Libya as a stable state, stable government that can maybe one day become as dangerous as the one before. And if we have actors like Clinton, they are always going to block anything that is going to, uh, that is, block some, any, anything that's good coming to Libya. As long as we have people who are not paying attention like Cameron government here, who really do not care or they're not sleeping in the, in the, in the watch, they're letting somebody like Sarkozy really just play around. Uh, you, dealing with Libya as if it was uh, a playground. Um, as long as we have those, it's, it's going to look bad and it's going to look maybe worse. Uh, but um, we are hoping that Clinton and her people and the likes of Clinton will not come to power. We're hoping that people like Cameron will go away. Somebody else who really um, wants to use the forum office or wants to use real policy or wants to engage Libya in a positive way, making a friend of Libya, the future of Libya, is really making, having Libya as a friendly, I mean, helping and building Libya is beneficial, political and economic to, economically to, to Britain. So if we don't have these people, I think the future could, uh, could be better. We will talk again, Mabrouk. Thanks very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me.